I'm a pediatrician, and the motivation for research in our research group is the betterment of the health of children. And the theme is the vitamin biotin. When I was a fellow in pediatric gastroenterology at the University of California, San Francisco, we shared a treatment room with the pediatric surgical service. One day I saw a baby with the rash shown here. This child was on total intravenous feeding. In addition to the distress caused by the rash, the child also showed delays in mental and motor development and a, and a curious kind of attitude towards life that was really reminiscent of depression in adults. The rash reminded me of a child that I had seen with an inborn genetic error in a biotin-dependent enzyme. And I knew from my PhD in biochemistry that deficiency of the vitamins typically works through deficiencies of the biotin-dependent enzymes. So I guessed that this child might be biotin-deficient even though it was not known at the time that biotin needed to be added to the vitamin supplement mix. I prevailed on the pediatric surgeons to supplement this child with biotin. And the results in the healing of the rash just in a few days as shown here was really dramatic and just as gratifying was what we saw in this child's accelerated development and joy of life in the next few weeks. I wrote up this case in the New England Journal of Medicine and it's really affected the course of the rest of my academic career. Our group focuses on research in biotin nutrition and applications of the vitamin as a technique. In our mouse model, in which we make pregnant mice biotin deficient, we see dramatic effects on fetal skeletal development. Shown here is the stunting of skeletal development in the biotin deficient mouse fetus compared to the biotin sufficient mouse fetus. And we see equally dramatic effects that result in high rates of cleft palate. Of course, mice are not just small, furry children. And we have to be careful in generalizations from mice studies to human studies. But there are reasons to believe that biotin deficiency might also cause human birth defects. Shown here are data from a famous study done in Hungary. 2,000 women received a trace mineral supplement, and 2,000 received a multivitamin supplement that contained folate and biotin. This forms part of the data in which folic acid is added to all wheat flour throughout the United States because it prevents many of the occurrences of neural tube defects, which include spina bifida and hydrocephalus. We found a very significant reduction in these human birth defects, and it suggests the possibility that the biotin and the multivitamin mix really did prevent human birth defects. We are currently conducting a study in the first trimester of pregnancy, which is the point at which many birth defects occur. We are looking at the activity of a biotin-dependent enzyme propionyl CoA carboxylase in the white blood cells of these pregnant women. If the PCC activity is low, we're offering them to the opportunity to participate in a second phase in the study in which they're randomized either to a biotin treatment or to a placebo that doesn't contain biotin to assess the effect on the enzyme activity. We've also recently discovered 
perhaps an even better indicator of biotin status, which we refer to as 3-hydroxy isovaloryl carnitine, or 3-HIAC. It may be better because it may be more suitable for field studies because it requires less, act, less careful storage and less careful preparation. Unfortunately, it requires a very expensive machine of which we wait in line and borrow our chances to use at the Arkansas Department of Health. In hopes we will be able to raise funds to support this activity, I've hired a mass spectrometer expert, the gentleman shown here, to join our research group of dedicated individuals who believe that the things that we are doing are going to have long-term important effects on human health. The second major area of study in our laboratory is the very low birth weight infant, shown here as an infant whose entire arm fits through the wedding band of her father. These infants suffer from a great variety of difficult and serious problems. One of the most common is anemia. This occurs from two things. One, these very premature infants do not make red blood cells at the rate of full-term newborns. In addition, we need to draw blood to take care of these patients. If we drew blood at the rate that you and I are used to as adults, we would draw all of their blood in a short period of time. And even with micro-testing, this group of patients is the most transfused of all in the United States. We're seeking to understand better how to prevent transfusions, to reduce donor exposures, and to get the baby to make more red blood cells on their own. Our approach is to label the red blood cells with biotin, shown in this cartoon as the little blue bees. This enables us, when the cells are taken back out of the baby, to use flow cytometry and the biotin label to make the red blood cells glow, as shown here, whereas the baby's endogenous cells are, disappear. When we give small amounts, along with the transfusion that the baby was going to receive anyway, we're able to see what percentage there are in the baby's circulation and back calculate to how badly the baby needed a transfusion and how much they benefit from the transfusion, as well as to follow the transfused cells over time to see how effective they are. We use these techniques for very practical assistance for these patients. For example, we have pioneered directed single donor programs where one person gives blood which is dedicated to just that baby and given in small amounts. And they're asked to come back at a later time to give an additional unit if that baby needs more blood, reducing the exposure of donors from perhaps nine to as few as just one. In addition, we're currently starting studies to investigate harvesting blood from the baby's placenta, which is the baby's blood, to save it and use it when the baby needs it. We're also using biotin and nanotechnology to characterize how the baby responds to erythropoietin the hormone that tells stem cells to differentiate into cells that make red blood cells and thereby optimize the dosage and the timing of erythropoietin therapy. And finally, in collaboration with our colleagues from Harvard and the University of Iowa, we're approaching a similar type of labeling of platelets, which are blood components necessary for clotting to, do, to label with biotin and thereby determine how fast the baby makes platelets, how quickly they consume platelets, and which ones might need a platelet transfusion.